Good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our weekly philosophical talks with Stephen Friedman. And we would like to thank Stephen Friedman first for being our amazing speaker. He is also the New York Times claimed a great philosopher, an artist, a scientist. And also, we would like to give big thanks to the U.S. Consulate General, American Space Almaty, and also you, the audience, for joining us weekly. And please make sure to, you know, give your comments, ask questions, and we will definitely address them in the end of the next session. And also, one uh, new thing, we will be having a two-week break because of the holidays, but we'll get back together in, on March 25th. So please stay tuned. And Stephen, thank you. Thank you very much, Alia, for the introduction, as always. Um, and I also would like to thank the American Consul General in Almaty. I'd like to say thank Dana, Elmira, the entire staff, the entire team that facilitates these talks, makes them possible on virtually a weekly basis. Um, as as Alia you know, mentioned, we're going to be taking a two-week break, and I want to wish you happy holidays during the break. Um, and then we'll resume. Um, I don't yet have the topic. Aliyah was asking me what might be the next to topic, and I was explaining something about my method, which is I, I look at international days, I see what might be in the news that might stimulate something of particular you know, pertinence. I, I might, oh, I get daily, there's a website um, from which I get um, daily emails giving major events in history you know, that correspond to a given date. So I don't yet know, and, and I also emphasize that one talk can lead to the topic for the next. Um, that was one of the things that occasioned the talk I gave on Valieva and the, the skating issue. Um, I had mentioned at the beginning of the previous week um, that I had a whole set of ideas about that, and Aaliyah expressed interest, thought that um, you, the audience, would be interested. And so that became the initial impetus for that talk. Um, and, and I've also, um, as also explaining to Aaliyah, that sometimes people's questions, your questions, might stimulate my thinking in a certain direction that I think might be worth exploring in greater detail. So um, I don't yet know what the following topic will be, but we will return after a two week break. OK, so um, I hope you will join us then. Tonight's topic is not occasioned by an international day. Um, it's occasioned by by events, international events, but there's there's always international conflict at some level, um, in some quarter. Um, so tonight's topic, I think, is relevant at every moment of human history. The um, this specific title um, is The Philosophy of Conflict and Its Resolution. Now, I can address this very quickly, very simply, to say that conflict arises within heuristic spaces. All conflict arises is a property of, a characteristic of certain features, certain aspects of heuristic spaces. All conflict resolves when it resolves within epistemic spaces. There, we're done in principle. And, and that's not to make light of this issue, but that represents an important point that is central to these talks in general. And that is that everything, everything I communicate, everything I address is distillable, distillable down to a few highly concentrated propositions, um, ultimately simple propositions, simple notions, but as always, simplicity can be the hardest thing to discern. E equals mc squared is a simple relationship. It's profound in its simplicity, understanding its full implications, understanding its roots, its sources, understanding what it ultimately says about the nature of our world takes a lot of elaboration. 
a lot of work, but the ultimate result is simple and elegant. That's true, I, I, at least I aspire to make it true, of my philosophical work. For example, you know, I've shown you repeatedly, you know, when we talk about heuristic H, when we talk about epistemic E, when we talk about the relationship between the two spaces, it's all formulatable in mathematical terms, in logical representations that distill an enormous amount of content that ranges over all of human experience. The aphorisms I write represent distillations. When I wrote my first books of aphorisms, like you know, decades ago, and I was working with actually a business manager who wanted to have them published, um, his, the problem he had with them was they were so concentrated that no one would understand them, you know, unless they were given some elaboration, some explanation. And, and he asked me, you know, would you be able to expand on these aphorisms? And at the time, you know, maybe I had written a few thousand, you know, now I've written maybe 20,000. And my interest was not in expanding on those aphorisms, but in developing more aphorisms to range over more aspects of human experience. But I always knew that as concentrated as the aphorisms are, as concentrated as these representations are, as concentrated as notions of heuristic and epistemic space are, it would take explanation, elaboration. It would take the kind of explanation, the kind of elaboration that these talks in particular are providing. That's what they're designed to address, again, philosophical issues, um, but or issues philosophically, but they're designed to address those issues not from a particular viewpoint or it, not from the perspective of a given, a particular opinion, a point of view, a, a belief. They're grounded in rigor. So ultimately the test of a philosophical proposition is its incontrovertibility. Even when it comes to the philosophical implications, aspects of of conflict, the nature of those heuristic spaces in which conflict arises, and the nature of epistemic space in which conflict ultimately resolves. All conflict ultimately resolves. Now, that's not to say it's easy to transition from one to the other, from a state of conflict, a heuristic state of conflict, to an epistemic state of its resolution. If it were easy, we wouldn't have conflict in the first instance. You know, I tell people the thought, the philosophical thought is difficult. It's difficult to distill it, to see how concentrated propositions, relatively simple propositions relate in so many different directions to so many different features of experience. But the philosophical thought is difficult. The alternative, and there, the alternative is the full range of tragedy of the human condition, the tragedy we experience. So the stakes here, the stakes in doing philosophy are very high in that we are seeking complete, definitive, incontestable solutions. And we can aspire to that because philosophy is grounded in rigor, but a limiting rigor, the limit of rigor, not the rigor of the relative rigor of a controlled experiment that from a philosophical perspective never achieves the limit of rigorous representation. Philosophy is the only area of human endeavor, human intellectual endeavor, where the results do not relate to anything outside of itself. The results are conditioned by an internal logic, an internal rigor that establishes their incontrovertibility. And that's where their power lies, and that's where their elegance, their beauty, and their power to address human 
challenges human suffering at every level of such suffering, including its most extreme, every level of conflict, including its most intense. So, since conflict arises in heuristic spaces, as is a characteristic of certain aspects of those spaces and resolves epistemically, once again, we will explore some features of those spaces, right? I go back to that always because it's the ultimate distillation of these results. I've, I think I've emphasized that whenever encountering a situation, a proposition, a discussion, an argument, ask oneself, is the issue heuristic? Is it epistemic? If it's heuristic, it's not validatable. It can be discussed endlessly, but it can't be rigorously resolved. If it's epistemic, it is not debatable because it is incontrovertible. So again, you see the, the importance of transitioning from a heuristic representation to an epistemic where resolution is ultimately achieved. I'm going to show you, I've, one of the things about these spaces, and we'll get into a little more concrete aspects of it, but I, I should caution you too. This talk is going to be more about principles, um, less about like specific prevailing conflicts. This is going to be, I'm taking a philosophical, a broadly and deeply philosophical perspective on the nature of conflict itself in all the forms in which it may arise. The, the second half of the talk, or later in the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, some oh, kind of real-world dimensions to this. Um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about Napoleon's maxims, his views on conflict, on military conflict. And, and I'm going to show um, sort of the grounding of some of his insights, his observations in broader philosophical frameworks. But um, that'll be a little bit later. Um, now I want to deal more, again, with general principles so we can understand conflict and its resolution deeply. One of the things about heuristic and epistemic spaces. And those are the only two technical terms I really use in these talks. And I use them because they summarize so much. One of the aspects that's important is these are not simple structures. These are not things that are defined. And then the definition gives everything about the structure. These are robust, rich structures. The epistemic encapsulates everything that philosophy aspires to. The heuristic encapsulates everything else in every other field of human endeavor, everything that is not rigorous. So these are, again, the term I use is robust. They have enormous content. They can be described, characterized in a variety of ways any one of which can be taken as a definition for some purpose. Now, I know, again, I'm speaking a little bit abstractly, but even if everything I'm saying is not perfectly clear, I think some of the spirit of what I'm saying might communicate the power you know, of the philosophical representation. Well, so... What are some of the ways that we characterize these spaces? Well, a heuristic space is an identity space. An epistemic space is a non-identity space. I've emphasized that within heuristic space, any two things are approximately equal for some purpose or other, like two chairs that can serve a utilitarian need, that can serve a, a function within the life of humanity, of society. An epistemic space is a disjunct space. It's a space where any two objects, any two points are radically distinct from each other. So 
Another way to characterize it is a heuristic space is a convergent space. Things come together based upon identities. That includes the ability to name an individual, that that individual in at different moments in different contexts is the same person. That object, the chair that we encountered yesterday is the same chair today and tomorrow. That requires an identity function that doesn't exist within epistemic space. Now you can say, well, but obviously these chairs are the same. Uh, this chair is the same as yesterday, tomorrow. I'm um, not, not so obviously. Um, if one were looking at the world quantum mechanically at that level, no two moments would be identifiable as the same. The, um, other ways to characterize these spaces. A heuristic space is a linguistic space. It has concepts within it. Things cluster together. Individual objects are grouped together as chairs or tables or people or planets or stars based on what Wittgenstein described as family resemblances, basic similarities for some purpose or other. The epistemic space, everything again, radically distinct. Another way to talk about these spaces, whatever you see that you can name, that you can describe, that you can apply language to, anything familiar is heuristic. If you were to open your eyes for the very first time on the world where you knew you had no prior experience, you knew nothing of what you were seeing, that wondrous encounter, that wondrous vision would be the epistemic. It, the epistemic, another way to describe it, is the world first viewed, independent of past experience. So when I write propositions, aphorisms like the past cannot guarantee the future, the future decides the past, I'm really describing certain aspects of the epistemic, the rigorous nature of our encounter with experience. An epistemic space has no internal symmetries. Again, no things are similar to each other. A heuristic space has such symmetries. Internal. I'm using some mathematical language here, I know. And again, I'm using it just because, again, the, the sound of it might com communicate something of, of the meaning, of the content. Um, some of you might be more mathematically attuned. And so, you know, you might find resonance in some of those representations, those characterizations. And as long as we're talking mathematical, here is a way, one of many ways, to depict an epistemic space. Now, this is an epistemic space in two basic ways. First of all, none of the points are grouped, are clustered in any way, in the way that here, this is a crude representation, a schematic of a heuristic space where points are being clustered together conceptually based upon certain similarities for certain purposes. Each one of those sets of points, one might be the set of dogs, one might be a set of cats, one might be a set of people, whatever the concept is grouping together as a set of elements. Another aspect of this is it has edges. So it's finite, it's bounded. That automatically distinguishes individual points from each other based on their location relative to one of the edges. That's a characteristic of the epistemic. If this were an infinite expanse, and again, I know I'm talking mathematically, in all directions, even as a plane, that would be a pure heuristic space. A heuristic space where each point is indistinguishable from each other, we can't characterize one relative to another, is transformed into an epistemic space where all of them are distinct by introducing certain kinds of boundaries, by introducing a singularity, like you, are born into such a space 
you see the world from a particular point. That singularity transforms that heuristic space into an epistemic existential space. Just that simple transformation goes from something that is conceptual to something that is real. I know I'm talking again in some broad mathematical terms, but just again, so that you can hear different ways in which these spaces, heuristic, epistemic are describable. So you see that there's, there's a lot of depth to the concepts. That's part of their power. But at the, at the same time, they come down to some very simple ways to represent them, right? The, the, whatever, you know, any two things are approximately equal for some purpose or other, that's heuristic. Any two things are rigorously distinct, distinguishable, me from you, any two points from each other, based even on location, that's the nature of the epistemic. If you want to experience the basic aspect of the epistemic and heuristic in our world, and again, the reason I'm doing this development is, as we'll see, the heuristic is the ground of conflict, and the epistemic is the ground of its resolution. If you want to experience a basic aspect of it, look around. The world is different in different directions. That is the imprint, the manifestation of the epistemic in our world. Also look around whatever you see that's familiar, that again, you can name or describe, that is what you saw yesterday. That is the heuristic, okay? So, um, and, and I wanted to make a point too. I know these mathematical representations, which I am drawn to, um, I feel that that's an important aspect of the characterization of these, of these spaces. Um, the mathematical is hard for everybody. It's hard for human beings. It's hard relatively for Einstein. It's hard for Archimedes. And here is an illustration of why it's hard. Okay. If you look at that, you can immediately see, without counting, that that's four, right? The human mind can see that one thing is one, two or two, three is three, and four is four, without having to count. But if I show you this, you cannot tell automatically just by glancing at it that that's seven. You have to count. After four, in general, we have to count. That's the nature of our mathematical limitations. There are cultures where the, the number system goes like this. One, two, three, many. Okay? So, um, again, I introduce the math, you know, there was, I think there was somebody, well, there was somebody once that came to um, one of my early shows um, of my pastel, not of my pastels, of my um, Polaroid, such as you see illuminated behind me. And the interior of the space of the gallery had, I don't know, a few dozen poles suspended, suspended from the ceiling in different ways. Um, on the walls of the gallery space, and this is the gallery where I've been represented for the last 20 years, on the walls of gallery space were the contents of one of my aphoristic books, about 52 aphorisms, I think. And I, I was friendly with one of the um, women who worked in the gallery. Um, her father was not from this country. I forget where he's from. He might have been from Mexico. Um, he, he spoke English, but not, it wasn't his native language, um, but he was interested in coming to see the show. Um, so his daughter brought him. Um, I wasn't there, um, but then at some point later, I was at his house and, um, and, he, and he was telling me that he couldn't understand 
the content of the aphorisms quite, but there was something about the sound, the sound in which, the sound of the words, you know, in which they were written that communicated to him their meaning. So in the same way, even without perfectly understanding the mathematical, right, he gives us a deeper sense. Now, I said that one of the characterizations of the heuristic is it's a convergent space. Things come together within that space. When things come together, they can form all kinds of results. The art that I do, the pole art, where each image is one brushstroke, as I've indicated in the past, and it's a little bit hard to see the imagery. So I'm gonna show you a close up on my phone of some of the imagery within like, those poles. Okay, so here, here is a close up of some of the imagery. Now, again, those images are done with a single brushstroke. So the, the lines that you see within those that are creating the images are not drawn. They're, they're created as paint sort of comes together almost, I describe it, tectonically. Okay, um, They represent boundaries of regions of paint. That's what forms the lines, and they're very precise lines. They're formed differently than the lines in general in paintings and drawings, which are drawn. These are not. These are, if you like, sculpted lines. I'll show you another, another example. Um, here's another sort of set of close-ups. So we're looking closely at some of the images that you see, and again, we see a lot of lines, we see a lot of content created in a very specific way. What I was interested in was the nature of the boundary and how boundaries create objects. So these are, in a sense, I'm investigating the conditions of objecthood when things come together. When, when two regions come together to create a boundary. Well, what am I describing as I just, and, and that boundary creates objects. Objects are fundamentally bounded structures, right? They have edges. They, they are distinguished from their environment, okay? They are set off by boundaries. When I, um, when I did the cancer work um, on the, which led to the development of mutated viruses, oncolytic viruses, they're now called, I was investigating sort of the conditions of an ideal cancer drug based on various kinds of boundaries that our understanding of molecular biology up to that point introduced into the description of the problem of cancer at its worst. But the point is that objects in, contain or are created by boundaries, by parameters, by conditions, okay? What are those conditions though? Those conditions, those boundaries are convergences. A boundary is an elemental convergence. Boundaries of that nature are characteristic, one of the fundamental characteristics of heuristic space, because heuristic space is a convergent space. Things are coming together. Another characterization of heuristic space is an objective space. An objective space, we think of as a space that exists independently of ourselves, as if we could ever know, right? Epistemically, there's no such thing because we can't experience a world independently of our experiencing of that world. Okay. But when, when we talk about an objective space, we're talking about a space that contains objects. And what do we mean by an object? Something existing independently of ourselves. 
that again is not a feature of epistemic space, but objects have boundaries. Boundaries represent convergences. So the reason that heuristic space contains objects is because it's a convergent space. And those convergences, those that coming together of elements is also the essence of conflict, right? When there is conflict, there is a convergence of elements, a, if you like, an unstable convergence, a convergence that is going to sort of change over time as the conflict plays itself out, but that it any type of conflict is a rep can be represented as a fundamental convergence, right? The, what are the sources of some of those conflicts? Well, when things come together in heuristic space, we are automatically engaging in what? Comparisons. Comparisons represent one aspect of convergence of things that come together. Um, the, the basis within the history of modern science um, for its robust development has been measurement, right? Um, one of the uh, most important aspects of Galileo's work was that he did measurements. He measured with a pen, he measured the period of a pendulum with his pulse. He was one of the first people to measure physical phenomena and then try to formulate mathematical relationships based upon the results of those measurements. Well, what's a measurement? A measurement is a convergence. When we, a measurement is a, a comparison, but really a convergence where we take, let's say, a measuring stick, a meter stick, a, and, and we, we, bring it together with whatever it is that we're measuring. And we see how many of those meter sticks cohere with, fit the length of whatever it is where we're trying to measure. So measurement itself is a process of convergence, of bringing things together, of establishing comparisons between a given object and a standard object. The standard object might be a meter stick. The standard object might be, in the case of time, you know, the vibration of an atom. It might be the rotation of the earth, something that has a repetitive aspect. Again, it's going, we're dealing with something within heuristic space because no two things are rigorously the same. And so no two things will stand up to a rigorous comparison epistemically. But so we see that within heuristic space, we are making comparisons. Measurements are comparisons. Comparisons are convergences convergences, bringing things together is the essence of any type of conflict, things coming together. The, a heuristic space is filled with objects. It's an objective space, right? It has boundaries. Things are bounded within it. It's also a space in which we work towards specific goals, right? That's in fact, what the term heuristic ultimately originally referred to as a method of achieving a certain result, of facilitating, accomplishing a certain goal. Well, when we have conflicting goals, right? We are going goals that as they converge, are mutually incompatible, right? Um, competitive goals. Competitive goals um, are common within heuristic space, right? When we understand biologically um, the, the, the nature of competition, that there are more living things, you know, within any given territory space terrain that can reasonably be accommodated over time. And so 
Darwin's fundamental insight, there will be a struggle for survival, a competitive struggle in which the most fit, the most adapted will flourish, will survive. By, by most adapted, we simply mean that which survives. But competition is, again, a coming together, right? When we have competitions in sports, like if it's, if it's a tennis match, there is a convergence of, of, the, of the competitors. When, where, when we are having a skating competition, I talked last week about skating, we are using what, measurements, criteria to assess performances, and then we are comparing them. We are using our numerical assessments to facilitate comparisons that then allow for an ultimate decision as to something being superior to something else. But again, all of these processes represent convergences. They represent things coming together in some way or other. Sometimes they come together stably, or at least stably for some intermediate period of time. The convergences here, the convergences that form these, the objects in this room are relatively stable, but only relatively so, right? Over enough time, these represent unstable convergences, unstable equilibria. Over time, the chair, the objects will, will decay. One of the features of conflict is decision-making. When, when we are engaged in, a con, in assessing some type of convergent process, we make decisions about how we're going to try to steer those events, right? If we are Oh, if we're engaging in athletic competition and we are committed to winning, you know, defeating our opponent, then we're going to marshal certain forces, right? We're going to make decisions about how much we're going to train, what type of training we're going to do, and, and what competitions we're going to enter. There are going to be a whole series of decisions we're going to be making. Decision-making is common to heuristic space because heuristic space is aiming in general at certain goals that represent objects that we're trying to create to fulfill whether that object is having a certain type of physique or having a certain type of personality or being skilled you know at at, at some particular type of activity we're trying to create a certain type of object we can say within that space well, we've talked about decision-making in, in other lectures. It's a major topic. It's something that occupies a lot of our time and, and energy. Um, in, in the area of, of diplomacy, um, the former Secretary of State um, of the United States, Henry Kissinger, one of the great diplomats in American history. Let me show you an image of Henry Kissinger. There, oh, there is Henry Kissinger, a Nobel laureate, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, one of the distinguished writers and thinkers about um, issues in diplomacy, in 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 the history of, of conflict. Kissinger emphasized in an article I read not too long ago that what matters in diplomacy is the outcome. Can we achieve a 
particular goal. It's the goal that is preeminent. Well, when we talk about goals, what are we talking about? We're talking about a characteristic of heuristic space. Heuristics are things that are designed to engineer goals, help us achieve goals. The functioning of convergence is to bring elements together, sufficient elements in the right order of the right weight to help us accomplish a particular goal. That goal might be certain types of negotiations. Those negotiations might introduce certain elements, certain features, certain trade-offs. But whatever it is, we are striving for a goal. That goal, in the case of diplomacy, is conflict resolution, um, a stable world order. But in any case, Kissinger emphasizes the goal, the outcome. When we talk about goals, outcomes, objectives, we are talking heuristically. It's a characteristic of that space in the same way as when we were talking about a complete solution right here, right now, independently of future experience, we're talking epistemically. We're talking about what religions aspire to. We're talking about what rigor achieves. So we're dealing with in, in diplomacy decision-making, right? Dealing with an evaluation of ends. But, and there's, there's when we talk about decision-making, I wanna say a few things about it. I wanna approach it from a couple of directions. Um, first of all, there's a famous American poet, Robert Frost. He um, lived in the early, well, the mid, uh, early to mid 20th century. Let me show you an image of Robert Frost. There's the poet Robert Frost, one of the distinguished American poets. Perhaps his most famous poem is a poem called The Road Not Taken. I've actually talked about it once. We talked about it once before, but that you know, was quite a while ago. I wrote down, I copied down the poem here, and I wonder, let me see, it's not very long. He was a lyric poet. He wrote relatively short, concentrated poetry. Um, it has four stanzas. I'll read you, not all of it, maybe about half of it. It's not long. So it's called The Road Not Taken. And it's a metaphor um, for decisions that we make in our life, decisions in general, decisions, again, that apply to our you know, decisions within politics, within diplomacy, within conflict resolution, wherever we are making a decision, the kind of decisions that Henry Kissinger was referring to when he talked about the ultimate outcome of those decisions being what matters. Robert Frost wrote, two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that passing there, had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Now, the metaphor is we come to a path and we have to choose left or right. Um, one, he notes, has been well traveled, you know, so it's a common path that others have trod, um, and the other not so traveled, and he decided to take that one, right? And the upshot is, 
It has made all the difference. That has made all the difference. That's the outcome. The outcome was determined by that initial choice and it was a different outcome than it would have been had he chosen the other path, the well-trodden path. Philosophically, rigorously, how do we know? How could we ever know? We can't. That's not, it's not in the nature of our world, in the nature of existence, as it is presented to us, that we are able to make that determination. This is, again, one of the famous poems in, in the history of American literature. It is the most famous poem by one of our most celebrated poets. And it's making a point that does not stand up to philosophical analysis and doesn't stand up for very good reason, for profound reasons. We can't ever evaluate outcomes. We can't go back and do an experiment where we take the other path and compare and see which was the better choice. We don't know. Maybe he would have ch chosen the other path and maybe the outcome would have been identical. Maybe it would have been better. There's no way of knowing. We think there's a way of knowing because we're speaking thinking heuristically where we can make these comparisons in our mind. But in terms of the brute reality of our circumstance, the existential reality, the singularity of our circumstance, there is no way to make the comparison, no way to know. There is no meaning to that final proposition. There's ultimately no philosophic meaning to the poem. It doesn't stand up to philosophical analysis. And in the end, it's that philosophical analysis that is redemptive, that, as we're going to see, is the source of conflict resolution and the resolution of all of our fundamental issues. Can't do the comparison ever. That's true of all our decisions. That's true of all our decisions with regard to any conflict. That's true to all of our decisions with regard to any decision we ever make at any level about anything. Our failure to understand that is a failure to understand not only the nature of our circumstances, but the key to what is redemptive about our circumstances, the singularity of our circumstances, that our situation, our circumstance cannot rigorously, rigorously be compared to anyone else's. Anyone else's now, anyone else's historically, anyone else's to come which means that whatever fate has befallen anyone before us need not be our fate. It is the singularity of circumstance that frees us from circumstance, frees us from the past, frees us from constraints, from boundaries that are characteristics of heuristic space, but fall away within epistemic space, the true reality of our circumstance. Now I deal with the issue of decision-making um, in a little more developed way. And again, I, I've recited this before, but I'm gonna do it again. Um, it's dealt with in Phalaris's bowl. And I wanted to show you, oh, here, let me show you. I've referred a lot to Phalaris's bowl. It's a play that I did in New York a few years ago, some years ago. Um, the whole title is Phalaris' Bull, Solving the Riddle of the Great Big World. Um, it's um, a little bit like the books of Joshua in that it's both autobiographical, um, deals with personal experiences, but also deeply philosophical, deals with you know, a lot of my philosophical results up to that time. And, and here's actually the book. There's, you can see the cover, um, that's a bull. And it's a sort of an optical, optically active image. Um, anyway, um, so I've 
recited things from the play. Um, let me um, recite this on decision making. Um, Harvard or Yale, Valley or Beach, Love or Solitude, Obscurity or Renown. What matters is not how we make the decision, but how to know we've made a correct one. Go to Harvard, rewind, go to Yale, compare. We can't rewind. Say we could. When to stop the comparison? After one year? Five? Ten? There's no stopping point. Say there were. What should be the initial terms of comparison? Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Nicaragua or an island? It's only within the inexactitudes of heuristic space that we think such decision-making meaningful. How then rigorously to decide? Flip a coin. At the least, your unwillingness to do so points to the nature of the assumptions you're making about the space you think you are occupying. Flipping a coin for all decisions by freeing us from unjustifiable claims affects a transition from heuristic to epistemic space, takes us on a random walk back to Eden. Now, this might seem counterintuitive. Flip a coin? Over decisions, all decisions, yes, yes. If you want to come to, con that's another way of coming to terms with the nature of epistemic versus heuristic, the nature of the true reality of our circumstance. Now, that's presenting a radical response, right? A radical view of our situation and its resolution. But the fact of the matter is every solution that rises to a level capable of addressing our deepest needs and concerns is radical. Christianity is radical, right? God becomes man, dies on the cross. Um, um, that death on the cross, tortured to death, is redemptive for the human race. That's radical, right? And, 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 and implications, thou shalt not judge, that's what we do all day long. Thou shalt not, that's radical. Or, or Buddhism, nirvana, the complete solution to the world is samsara, is this world right here of change. Where you are standing right here, right now, in all of your suffering is also the point of a complete solution definitively if you just understand the nature of one's of your circumstances. That's radical. I've read excerpts from the Heart Sutra, that summary of, of Buddhism from the perspective of one of its major traditions. And, and it talks about there is no suffering. There is no extinction of suffering. There is no birth. There is no death. That's a radical response. And I'm reminded of what Kierkegaard said about Christianity, that it's a radical solution. And like every radical solution, like a radical surgery, one puts it off as long as possible. But, you know, again, nothing, you know, the, the, the philosophical thought is difficult, the alternative unbearable. The common sense of death cannot be born. So, and again, you think, well, again, decision-making over flipping a coin over issues of life and death, how did the Western philosophical tradition begin? It began with the greatest of all philosophers, Socrates. And it began most emphatically as we really experienced the tradition in Plato's Apology. Now, that was the first dialogue that Plato wrote, which dealt with Socrates' trial by the Athenian court and his condemnation to death for corrupting the youth of Athens with his teachings that taught people to question the gods, question the nature of what they thought was their claims to know. And, and I quoted this before, I quote this a lot um, because it says so much. Um, the final line of Plato's apology 
are the words that Socrates says to his friends after having been condemned to death. He says to them, and so we go our separate ways, you to live and I to die, and which is better, only God knows. Well, if that's the nature of our circumstance, if that's the nature of our philosophic circumstance that one cannot know, and what one cannot know, one should not presume to know. Well, then it's reasonable to flip a coin. Even over an issue of life and death, that is the nature of epistemic space, the nature of, again, the radical, rigorous response to our circumstance. The, another aspect of heuristic space that bears upon conflict, its resolution, our decision-making about conflict, is what we think we can learn from the past. We are told that, in fact, a, a major 20th century philosopher, George Santayana, um, who was a philosopher at Harvard, actually, uh, before I was there, um, but a, a celebrated, really, um, philosopher of history, um, wrote that you know, whoever you know, does not know the past is condemned to repeat it. And, and this issue of, of repetition is really central to our scientific response to the world, our understanding of the world, that if we repeat a set of circumstances, we're going to get the same result, right? If we you know, light something if, on fire, we're going to get a conflagration. You know, our laws of nature refer to repetitive types of encounters with the world. And what we can expect from those encounters, that's how we hold sway, um, control, you know, experience through those types of formulations. But of course, not rigorously so, right? And, and when it comes to the lessons of the past, for any given historical event, whether it's events surrounding World War II, whether it's the rise of Adolf Hitler, whatever it is, despite all the writings, in fact, the reason there are so many writings about any given historical event, any given historical outcome, the conditions that led to the development of Nazism that led to the Holocaust, that led to the conflagration of World War II. There are thousands of, of books and articles, probably millions at this point, of books and articles reflecting upon the circumstances that produced a given result. The reason there can be thousands and millions of such articles and, and books is because we're dealing with something heuristic. We're dealing with something that is not rigorously decidable because we cannot go back in time and alter a circumstance and see if the outcome is the same or different. To know that a given factor was in fact instrumental not possible to do that. I think we can because we think, you know, in terms of heuristic space, that's the nature of our language, right? It clusters things together based upon approximate similarity. So moments from the past are approximately the same as moments from the present or other moments elsewhere. We can make comparisons. We, we, we group things together, you know, within, again, a certain oops, conceptual structure you know, like that's a simple way to represent the grouping mathematically. And we think we can draw conclusions and we can draw conclusions that have heuristic value. They can sort of guide us, but again, we can't ever evaluate the outcome. So, you know, we're kind of engaging in, well, the writing of historical analysis is really a job. It's a profession, but it's not providing definitive 
insights because we cannot know because we cannot go back in time and do the experiment to decide. And so there can be endless debate because we're dealing with a heuristic space. Now, when it comes to um, issues of repetition, it's something that I've also dealt with in, in my philosophical work and in Phalaris's bowl, the idea that um, you know, that notion that the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a, a different result is insanity. Uh, no, it's not, because we can't do the same thing over and over again. The, the, the problem with our relationship, our thinking about the world, is that we think we can effectively do things over and over again. There's always some difference. And from a rigorous standpoint, a philosophical standpoint, what ultimately matters in terms of resolving our issues, challenges, conflicts, is any difference. When we use a battering ram to break down a wall, we achieve the result because every time we apply that battering ram to the wall, we're doing that application against a different historical background. Instead of it being the 10th application, it's now the 11th. It's now been preceded by 10 previous impacts, encounters. Every difference matters. Every difference is decisive from the standpoint of rigor. So thinking that we can do the same thing repeatedly locates us in puristic space where tragedy resides. The tragedy of the comparisons we make. The tragedies of our presumptive evaluations as to how things are going to turn out at the end of time as if we could possibly know. Even as to the issue of death, I, I have this in Phalaris bowl. When someone dies, what do you know? Really? No. That they will not return to the end of all time? How do you know that exactly? You don't. But you live and die as if you do and suffer. We suffer a presumptive space. We, we, we suffer when we evaluate any conflict because we, we presume to know the nature of the outcome and to know where ultimate value lies and we do not. That is not the nature of our circumstance. And whatever you do, whenever you do not come to genuine terms with the rigorous nature of our circumstance, well, you suffer. There's um, that issue of presumption. It's also dealt with in Phalaris's bowl. There's a section. Um, I go back to um, the issue of the Garden of Eden, right? In, in the Judeo-Christian Islamic myth of, of creation and of the fall of humanity from grace and, and the acquisition of human suffering. Right, where it becomes part of the human condition and, and specifically becomes part of the human condition when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I address that issue. I, I talk about how it's normally seen as an act of disobedience, that they were told not to eat of the fruit of that tree, and they did, and as punishment, they were cast out of Eden, and that became the fall of humanity, and from that point on, humanity was condemned to suffer in all the different forms that human beings can suffer, right? Everything suffering, all the indignities of age, all aspects of mortality.
Let's see, should I recite? I wonder. Um, let, me, let me recite. It's a short, it's a little paragraph. The Judeo Christian Islamic tradition begins in the garden. Adam and Eve, human suffering enters the world when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The source of evil is seen as the act of disobedience. But they could have been prevented, they could have been forbidden to turn over a rock. Why the tree of knowledge? How does it link to suffering? This is how. But something is, determines whether it is good or bad, determines what determines its value. But what something becomes over time decides what it is. And we can't know for sure what it will become. Our sense of value is a presumption against all future time. We suffer, not a reality, but a presumption. That is the ground of pain. We suffer the pain of cancer as decay. We embrace the pain of bodybuilding as enhancement. The outcome we presume decides the value, decides the outcome and the ultimate degree to which we suffer the experience. It's a presumptive relationship to the world. We suffer that we presume more than we know to the end of time. Heuristic space is a presumptive space. Epistemic space is non-presumptive. Epistemic space claims nothing, right? Epistemic space in terms of linguistic structures. Epistemic space sees each point as radically distinct from each other. Some things about that tragic heuristic space. Um, there's a famous saying, um, I don't know where I read this, it is the testimony of the ages that there is little happiness, especially when we get what we want. Again, this applies to everything. It applies to diplomatic outcomes, it applies to the outcome of any conflict, especially when we get what we want. There's a, a famous curse that actually um, seems to have arisen in lots of different cultures. If we, when you look it up, sometimes you'll see it ascribed to various native cultures, sometimes Chinese civilization, sometimes Buddhist cultures. Um, it's the curse, may you get what you want as if we really know what will satisfy us. It's the relationship that um, Steve Jobs worked against. He said, or, 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 or Henry Ford, the car builder, like the person who transformed the car industry in the United States, beginning of the 20th century, said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Steve Jobs never went to focus groups, never sort of polled people, you know, did studies to find out what people wanted. His sense is people don't know what they want until they see it. You, we are not that prescient about our, ourselves, about our circumstances. And, and again, we can't anticipate outcomes. That's again where the philosophic, the epistemic, um, responds to our needs. I, I've emphasized the aphorism that first showed me the power of philosophy to address challenges of human circumstance, phobias and fears and, and even physical pains, selflessness, how one acts not out of need, that even our needs are presumed. If, if Socrates can contend legitimately that we don't know whether life is superior to death, then what value do we invest our presumed needs with? And again, you might think you need, and I go, this is again, radical, again, a 
rigorous space is a radical space in the same way that a Buddhist space is radical, a Christian and Islamic space are radical representations you know, of, of experience. But we think we need oxygen, right? But from this point forward, in the same way as even if you, let's say, embrace the Bible, let's say the, the New Testament, the Old Testament within the Christian tradition, um, as the word of God, the guide to life. Well, remember what St. Augustine, the great church philosopher, um, early in the history of the Christian church said, of God, we can say nothing, nothing which means that from where we stand here and now, we can't claim that the Bible that seems to us to be the word of God and may have been the word to live by up until yesterday may not, for reasons of God's own, that he, she, or it decided not to reveal to us today or yesterday or tomorrow, no longer is his her, its word, for reasons not revealed to us. We presume more than we know, as if there were no time, even as to our needs, even as to life and death. That's the nature of the rigorous response to our circumstances. There's a... Um, the night my father died, I wrote a lot of philosophy. Um, I was immersed in the writing of philosophy. I wrote about 145 aphorisms that night, which is, you know, I mean, when I was first writing philosophy, I might write one aphorism a day. Here I wrote 145 in one night. And they were partly spurred by something I read that day um, from a letter by the English poet Keats, John Keats. John Keats was a great English poet of the Romantic period, the early 19th century, but also a great letter writer and literary critic in his letter writing. Well, he made the comment. He, he embraced his, his role as a poet and he thought it was one of the great roles to be given, to pursue, but he thought, the philosophic was, was even higher you know, to aspire to. And he said, he wrote, the most interesting of all questions is to what degree, through the efforts of a seldom appearing Socrates, mankind, humanity, may be made happy. Well, philosophic response, the philosophic response to the resolution of conflict is you enter that rigorous space, that philosophic space, that epistemic space. And why is that space without conflict? How does it resolve conflict? Because it's a divergent space. A heuristic space, our, the space of our presumptions, of our approximate thinking about the world, of our claims to know more than we do, is an objective space, a space where we pursue goals, where we bring things together. Conflict arises when things clash, when things collide, when they converge in varieties of ways. An epistemic space is divergent. Any two things are radically distinct. There is never conflict within that space or conflict resolves within that space because of its fundamental nature, the fundamental nature of our circumstances as a divergent space, a radically divergent space where any two points, any two objects, any two people are rigorously distinct, do not converge. That's the nature of the philosophic resolution. And I'm going to talk about, and, and that philosophic resolution is achievable in actually two ways. It's achievable when one enters that space, as it were, that embraces that non-identity function. A is not equal to A. There are no comparisons. 
No comparisons are rigorously supportable. No comparisons are in our fundamental philosophic interest. No comparisons resolve our circumstances, resolve the world, because they represent, again, a convergent process. And a convergent process is a heuristic process. A heuristic process represents an approximation to reality, not the fundamental reality that we experience rigorously. The other way that we enter that space is through HCE. The limit of the heuristic is the epistemic. All things converging, not just a few, but all things converge to one thing. That's a point of epistemic reality, to again use technical terms. Another way to say this is how does conflict resolve when all things become one thing? Well, Imagine a world government, right? We're all peoples, you know, we're equal under some sort of world government. That type of political representation of a universal convergence is also a state in which conflict resolves. But the, the, the rigorous resolution is just within the epistemic space in which divergence, not convergence, is the operative function, functionality. Now, I know I'm, I've talked longer about some of these things than I had planned to, but I did say I wanted to talk about some viewpoints of Napoleon, and let me do that. I'm gonna do that a little more quickly than I might otherwise have, because I have some questions I wanna to get to at the end also. Um, but let me, um, okay, so, Napoleon wrote maxims, lots of maxims about the nature of war, the nature of conflict, the nature of how to conduct, you know, that type of conflictual process. Here are some of his comments, and I want to, again, make a relation to um, their philosophic ground, or to a degree they might have one. One, how many things apparently impossible have nevertheless been performed by resolute men who had no alternative but death? When we are achieving a goal in, in heuristic space, convergent space, we bring factors together. We want to win a battle. We have more troops. We have more armaments. But we also have more powerful armaments, more powerful motivation. Right. All factors matter when we are in that type of conflict, right, that we are trying to resolve heuristically. Remember, we're not going to be able to marshal everything. We're going to be able to marshal some number of things. Within heuristic space, we achieve a given goal through some degree of convergence by right? bringing together some number of elements, some number of troops, some number of arms, some number of some magnitude of weaponry. The atomic bomb, like in Hiroshima, was a new order of weaponry that helped precipitate the conclusion of that war the day and week that it, you know, that it did. Um, the, the degree of motivation you know, of a soldier, of a fighter, is another convergent factor that and if you are faced with no alternative but to fight, you fight more vigorously. That becomes a more weighted convergent element. Just showing you the relationship between these ideas and our general structures of heuristic, especially, and to some degree epistemic space maybe. Um, number two, if they want peace, nations should avoid the pinpricks that precede cannon shots. I read a long time ago Thucydides on, on the history of the Peloponnesian War. And what you find is people are going to war because of slights, because they feel insulted, they feel denigrated in some way, and suddenly they're at war. Our egos within heuristic spaces are vulnerable because we're constantly making comparisons, right? And those comparisons, you know, are from an epistemic, a rigorous standpoint, arbitrary. We don't have to make those comparisons, but we do. And we do to our peril, often leading to conflagration, to war. 
Remember, any show of power is a demonstration of weakness, that we have to resort to that power, to that display. Um, let's see, three. If you had seen one day of war, you would pray to God that you would never see another. Always useful to keep in mind the perspective of someone who's actually experienced that type of conflict, that type of, of horror. Okay, a few more of these. Um, let's see. Um, okay, this is actually something you also see in Sun Tzu, um, another great historian, I mean, philosopher of war. An army's effectiveness depends upon its size, training, experience, and morale. Those are convergent elements, right? If we want to achieve a goal, we bring elements together. And morale is worth more than any of the other factors combined. Again, it's the weight of that element. That's why if a country invades another country, the, the country that's being invaded has the advantage often of the greater morale because they are fighting a more desperate battle and they're often more highly motivated. Um, these again are, 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 are heuristic factors that um, help determine outcomes, um, but not rigorously, right? You never know, you can have high morale, but if you counter that with enough troops or armaments or whatever, that morale can be defeated. That's the nature of the heuristic space of conflict resolution through weights of convergence. Um, in war, moral factors account for three quarters of the whole. Relative material strength accounts for only one quarter. That's been said over and over and over again by, by military leaders. Um, six, sometimes a single battle decides everything and sometimes to the slightest circumstance describes, decides the issue of a battle. In life, in juristic spaces, everything matters. Um, there are only two forces in the world, the sword and the spirit. In the long run, the sword will always be conquered by the spirit. In other words, Force can only impose its will for so long, over so much time. Eventually, people have to be won over. People need to, like Rome was successful during its rise because even when it conquered surrounding territories, it won people over. And it won people over. There's a famous movie, Life of Brian, um, about it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's about actually the life of Jesus, but it's a, it's a comedic take on the, that time. Um, and, and one of, there's a, there's a group of, um, of people fighting against Rome. Um, and they're, they're sort of discussing, you know, their motivation and, um, and they have lots of, of quarrels and they're objecting to Roman rule. Um, and one of them, um, but they keep on proposing certain advantages to Roman rule. Um, and 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 the the comment from the um, the film is, I have it here quickly. Um, let me just get it. Um, yes. Okay. So, all right, all right. But apart from this, is like some um, the leader of the group responding to all of these. Um, suggestions as to the advantages of living under Roman rule, living as part of the Roman Empire, um, which they had been conquered, but now they were you know, submitting to or being forced to submit to. Um, all right, all right, but apart from better sanitation and, and medicine and education and irrigation and public health and roads and a freshwater system and baths and public order, what have the Romans done for us? Well, again, that is the triumph of the spirit over the soul, that you, you satisfy people's needs at fundamental levels and you can win them over and that creates a stable society. That can resolve conflict. The spirit, stronger than the sword. That was Napoleon's final word on war in conflict. Okay, and then I wanted to end with a poem um, 
a little poem that I wrote. Um, the title of it is Diplomacy, and it deals again with conflict resolution. Um, diplomacy. Sound the alarm, arm, charm, and always do no harm. Okay, so um, that's a reasonable point at which to conclude our talk. Um, I have some questions from last time, and I have, oh, five minutes, not a lot of time. I will deal with them quickly, um, but hopefully I will, I hope I will deal with them adequately. I'll talk fast. Um, okay, um, first, could you tell me what is the best way to speak English very fast? Okay. For anything, it's obviously practice. What I recommend is when you are listening to someone speak English, when you're watching an English program, anticipate what's coming next. Always anticipate. And then take sentences that somebody might be saying, sentences that, that, that you hear, and repeat them to yourself over and over again to create patterns within your mind that are readily available when you are speaking the language. But then always try to think ahead. If you kind of can lead forward, lead your, your, your speech forward so that you're anticipating what to say next and you have a battery of phrases, of sentences that you practiced repeatedly that can ultimately speed up your speaking of English but it's, it's practice and it's repetition, but especially repetition of specific forms, forms that you like, sentences that you like the sound of, and always anticipate what's going to be said next and try to think ahead as you're speaking, what to say next, and that can lead you forward more quickly than otherwise, but it's a matter of practice. Um, next question. How is the situation with the 1988 Olympics and this year's Olympics different? What happened to Camilla Valieva, if you could compare? Okay. In 1988, there was a doping, a drug scandal. Primarily, I think the focus here was on Carl Lewis, one of the great American sprinters. Um, he was one of the stars of that time in the way that you know, Camilla Valieva is at the top of her you know, profession, skating uh, within, within the skating world. Um, Carl Lewis um, tested positive for stimulants, three different stimulants. They were related to cold medicines, epinephrine, um, pseudoephedrine, um, and the, the American Olympic Committee, I think, protested. Um, he was allowed to compete. Um, that was a deeper scandal in my estimation than the Valieva scandal because those drugs that he was accused uh, that he tested positive for were actually drugs that were commonly used to to conceal um, to camouflage the use of other more problematic drugs anabolic steroids that are not just producing a short-term effect but a long-term structural change in the body building muscle tissue that gives one a, a significant advantage in competition um, in addition he tested positive before the olympics and so the controversy played out before the olympics camilla valieva did not even though there was the, the, the test that turned out to be positive did not come to light until the middle of the Olympics. And, and again, there were lots of potential extenuating circumstances that haven't yet been explored fully, um, that were not, there was not enough time to explore, you know, in the middle of the Olympics. That's why she was permitted by the court um, of arbitration for sport to compete, namely, the possibility of contamination, the possibility of accidental contamination. Her grandfather was on that same medication. Maybe, for all we know, he would crush his medication, put it in a glass of water, and, and she used a similar glass. It wasn't thoroughly clean. There are always traces. So, you know, there are all kinds of extenuating circumstances. And in the case of Valieva, it's a short-acting drug. She tested negative at the beginning of the Olympics, so she was not under the influence of that drug in the way that Carl Lewis may have been under the long-term influence of anabolic steroids. We don't know. Um, okay, quickly. Um, okay, you can say that anyone can fail, which is true. Um, 
Is anyone can't tell which is true? Yes, we have enough resistance. It's a convergent process. We need enough support. But is it true that almost anyone can succeed given, but is it not true that almost anyone given the right conditions, what do you think? Um, is it not true that almost, yes. We don't know whether we can succeed or not until we stop trying. You know, I give the example always of, of Van Gogh who at 27 had no discernible artistic talent. And 10 years later, his artistic talent through perseverance has manifested itself to such a level that he's now regarded as the most popular great painter in history. You don't know in advance, no matter what. So you can always succeed. You can never say, no, this is impossible. I mean, there might be, you know, certain like physical constraints, you know, like as, you, as you age, it's going to be harder to master, you know, to compete athletically. But in terms of lots of things that bear upon like cognitive abilities, um, there's, it's not clear what the limit is unless one stops trying. And finally, I know very quickly, um, what is the role of winning? by making mistakes in performances. Some of the greatest performances have been laden with mistakes. And the most famous example is Michael Jackson, the great American performer, popular music singer, um, who became especially famous for what's called the moonwalk. It was kind of a backward walk that he had practiced for months that he um, first exhibited during a um, uh, kind of a, the, the, a celebration of the history of Motown music, I think. Um, it was a well-covered event. He did this maneuver, this backward walk, this moonwalk on, on stage. Everyone was stunned by it. And Michael Jackson later, when he was asked about it, lamented the fact that he had practiced it for months and he was not able to perform it at the level to which he had practiced it. He thought he had failed in the execution of that performance. Performance, but nevertheless, that failure goes down as one of the great successes in the history of performance. Okay, I know I went through those very quickly, um, but I, I hope that gave you at least some sense of, of my thinking on those issues, on um, some guidance. And, and again, we will not be having talks the next two weeks, but we will the following week on a topic to be announced. And I want to wish you all the happiest holidays during our break. Stephen, thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you for all your talks, the information provided, which we'll appreciate it all. And one more time, we'd like to give you big thanks and really thank you very much for being with us weekly. Yes, and thank you, the audience, for joining us. Uh, we see all your feedback. Please make sure to write your comments after the session as well. We will definitely address them in two weeks. Stay safe and happy upcoming holidays. And thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you for joining.